the old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. So today is a very special episode. I'm overjoyed to introduce the amazing, the wonderful, the greatest expert on violence I think that we really have in our world, the wonderful James Gilligan, doctor, professor, <laughs> extraordinaire. We have, uh, we're able to connect a few months earlier uh, working on this film. I was very uh, surprised to just call his number that I found on the internet and hear him pick up and uh, ask him to participate in the film, to interview and talk about these these issues that we dive so deeply into. And he just said, I, I when I told him about the project and I said, we're talking about this and this and this, he said, it would be my joy. These are my life's work to help people understand these issues. So so today's issue is violence, this concept, this, this public health emergency, this national epidemic, international epidemic that we all face that seems to only get worse and worse all the time with school shootings and random violence and, and all of these uh, manifestations in war and political violence, structural violence. So without further ado, I'd just love to have you basically define that term, James. What is violence? What is its cause? And what, what do we do about it? Uh, sure. Let me begin by saying that uh, that's what I mean by the term violence. By violence, I mean the infliction of uh, particularly physical injury, although it can also be psychological or emotional, but especially lethal physical injury to human beings that causes their death. Uh, there are two forms of that uh, uh, in, uh, on an individual and interpersonal scale, namely homicide and suicide. Those are two behaviors that cause the death of individuals. There also is uh, collective political violence, wars, uh, genocide, terrorism, and, and so on. Uh, those are all forms of behavioral violence, meaning violent behavior by, by individuals. I mean, even wars, although they're collective, they're fought by individuals, killing other individuals sometimes by the millions. But there's another form of violence that is even more deadly, which uh, some Scandinavian sociologists uh, uh, have called structural violence. And that's the term I've uh, used. In fact, I wrote an encyclopedia article on the subject. Uh, structural violence is the increased death rates among the poor and the weak uh, compared to the rich and the wealthy in societies whose economic structure divides people into the rich and the poor, or the powerful and the weak. Uh, structural violence, actually, I'd say two things about it. One thing is it kills far more people than all the behavioral violence put together, all the murders and suicides and wars. Gandhi was completely correct when he said, that the deadliest form of violence is poverty. Poverty actually kills far more people than all the murders and suicides and wars in our society. And I say that, not I'm not just speculating. Uh, I've done a lot of work with the World Health Organization, which has a Department of Injuries and Violence Prevention. They have measured the rates of death and the causes of death across the entire world. And what they have found is that the deaths that occur from uh, from economic inequality, that is relative poverty, are are far greater than the deaths caused by all the various forms of of uh, behavioral violence. Um, so, my own work with violence has been very uh, 
experiential. I'm talking about my own personal experience working with violent offenders. I got interested in the study of violence, oh my gosh, 55 years ago when I was in my psychiatric training uh, at the Harvard Medical School. And uh, I had the opportunity to do something that I had never heard of and actually had no interest in at the beginning, uh, which was called prison psychiatry. Uh, it was the last thing I expected to spend my time working on as a psychiatrist. I thought I'd work with people more or less like myself who were, you know, middle class dealing with, you know, intra-psychic conflict and so forth, or people with major mental illnesses. But it never occurred to me that I would want to go any nearer a violent person than I could avoid. But I, uh, I enlisted into an elective rotation called prison psychiatry. Up to that point, I had been taught that people who were violent were untreatable because uh, they wouldn't, they would, they were sociopaths that would only tell you lies, and you can't cheat anybody, you know, in psychotherapy or anything who's that won't be honest with you. I was taught they would only want to manipulate you into letting them out of prison and so on. So I went into that with no expectations that, it would, that I would really accomplish anything. The moment I got there, I discovered everything I had been taught up to that point, everything I thought I knew was wrong, or at best a half truth with the most important half left out. And that was that people who committed even the most horrific acts of violence, when you sat down with them and you talked with them and you got to know them and you listened to them and learned from them, you could discover what gave people the incentive to commit acts of violence that are just off the scale for what most of us would, you know, hope that we would ever uh, commit. Although one thing I learned from this experience is everybody has a potential for violence. And if you just subject them to certain social conditions that produce the, the motives for violence, uh, Anybody can become violent. Um, so I worked um, with violent offenders. And what I say today will start absolutely with my individual experiences, what I heard, what I observed. So I'm not talking from theory or speculation. I'm talking from actual experience with murderers, rapists, often multiple murderers or serial murderers, and so on. Now. Why is violence an important subject? Uh, and particularly, why should a psychiatrist get involved? Traditionally, we have delegated as a society, and I may say almost all civilizations in history, have delegated violence to the criminal justice system and said that's for the police and the uh, criminal courts. You know, and violent people are sent to prisons and we lock the door and and ignore them for 40 years, let them die in prison, or else we release them, not having learned anything from them about why they've become violent in the first place. So what I uh, realized was that, I look, I was trained as a doctor, and I was trained to look at any source of death or disability or injury as a public health problem and a medical problem. So my thought was, you know, if somebody comes into a hospital and they're suffering from a life-threatening disease, cancer, heart disease, whatever, we don't just lock the door on them and walk away. We sit down and we try to understand what brought about that life-threatening process in them. We try to learn. We do research. We investigate. Uh, we use the sick, actually, because we have to use them in this way, as the sources of knowledge and information about what kills people. And we were not doing that with people who were, were violent. Uh, even my own profession, uh, psychiatry, if you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual called DSM uh, uh, of the American Psychiatric Association, they do list one form of violence as appropriate for psychiatrists to study, and that is suicide. But what do they say about homicidal behavior? 
not a word. They have completely delegated the study and research on violent behavior to the criminal justice system, which doesn't have the slightest interest in doing research on the causes and prevention of violence. The only questions the criminal justice system asks are, how evil was a particular violent offender and how much punishment does he deserve? Now, those are moral questions. They're not empirical questions about causes of violence and prevention of it, the way we would approach cancer or heart disease. So what struck me was we need, if we want to deal with the epidemic of violence in our society, we need to look at it as a problem in public health and preventive medicine, including preventive psychiatry. And uh, all the, everything that the criminal justice system and the legal system is doing is beside the point because it is not even attempting to answer the question of what causes people to become violent and what can we do to prevent it. Uh, well, if I could, if I could say, I mean, it goes even further than that. I mean, it's, it's as, as I've really uh, learned from your work, I mean, it, it's doing the opposite. It's increasing the violence in our society. It's increasing through punishment, through, you know, the, the increase of shame, which I'd love right. for you to talk about that, that root of violence in shame, that when you punish people, it makes them more shameful. It makes them more repressed. It makes them less able to deal with their emotions and it makes them more violent. And it's just, this is like the, the um, <clears throat> consistent thread in all of these aspects of our society. Our whole incentive, you used that word earlier, the, the whole incentive structure of our society is completely inverse. It's completely uh, upside down and inside out. Like, you know, giving people uh, extrinsic reward for a task, we think, oh, it's going to make you do a better job. It makes you do a worse job. We think punishing people for doing something wrong is going to make them do it, not do it again. It makes them do it again. <laughs> I think it's interesting how in America, especially, it seems we treat uh, acts of violence like some kind of baseless oddity that have no no tangible root or foundation in our society. Like it's completely separate from from you know our day to day activities and the way that we live our lives. And and I just think that it is a um, a hallmark example of just how out of touch of, with reality we are as a society that we can't even recognize the causalities of, of the violence that, that we're enduring right now and at an unprecedented level, considering the mass shootings that we've seen recently, especially. You're absolutely right. The, the criminal justice system hasn't even asked these questions of what causes violence and what we can do to relieve it. They have acted, uh, as, as you said, Zachary, on the, uh, ass, the kind of tacit assumption, which they've never even uh, tested, that <laughs> punishing people <laughs> will prevent violence. Uh, but in fact, you're absolutely right. And I have, I have a dozen different lines of evidence uh, supporting this, that punishment far from inhibiting violence or diminishing the level of violence in our society is the most powerful cause of violence that we've ever discovered. I wrote an article once called Violence and Punishment is the criminal justice system based on one huge mistake? And I think that the fact is, is correct. For example, the United States has the highest imprisonment rate of any country in the world. Uh, not just the other developed economies and democracies, but uh, even the countries that we call police states. So you think if punishment uh, uh, would prevent violence, we'd have the lowest uh, murder rates. In fact, we have the highest murder rates by far of any developed economy, any democracy on earth. Our murder rates are average seven times higher than, than those of the countries in the European Union, and a good five times higher than the other English-speaking democracies in Canada, Australia, and so forth. Uh, and. Uh, you know, we are also the only Western democracy that still has the death penalty. Uh, I've often said that if the U.S. petitioned to join the European Union, which of course we're not going to do, but if we did, we would be rejected because we are barbarians uh, <laughs> according to the value systems and moral values of the Euro Western European countries because we still have the death penalty, which they have abolished. We still permit long-term, uninterrupted, solitary confinement for up to 30 or 40 years. 
for one, any one individual, and many individuals suffer this, they would say that this is cruel and unusual punishment, to quote something from our own constitution, which we've just ignored. Uh, but the fact is, it obviously it doesn't prevent violence, because we are the most violent country by far of any of the developed economies or any of the democracies on the face of this earth. So I think the, the anybody who would anybody who would claim that punishment uh, inhibits or prevents violence or lowers the rates of violence in our society, the burden of proof is on them. I mean, they 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 really uh, all the evidence we have says the opposite. Now, why would that be? When I've asked, oh my God, I've dealt with well over a thousand of the most violent murderers our society produces, uh, probably several thousand by now over more than 50 years. Uh, I've asked them, you know, why they assaulted somebody or even killed somebody or raped somebody. And I've almost always gotten the same answer to with a remarkable degree <coughs> of consistency. And that is because he disrespected me or she disrespected me. And uh, they use that uh, reference to disrespect so often they've abbreviated it into the slang term, uh, uh, he, he dissed me or she dissed me. And it struck me that anytime people use a word so often they abbreviate it, it tells you something about how central it is in their emotional and moral vocabulary. What I'm saying is that what stimulates violence, and I'd say it's even necessary, although it alone is not sufficient to cause violence, is the feeling of being disrespected or what I've used the generic term uh, shamed or humiliated. Uh, I, I'm use, I use shame as kind of the generic term for all forms of shame and humiliation, the same way we use the word flower as a generic term for roses and daffodils and tulips and so forth. What I'm saying is that I've concluded from, from decades of work and research <coughs> Pardon me, with a lot of people, that the necessary cause of violence is feeling shamed and humiliated. Now, as a as a physician, I knew that's true. For example, of many uh, diseases. For example, tuberculosis. If you ask people what causes tuberculosis, <coughs> pardon me, they will tell you, of course, quite accurately. It's the tubercle bacillus, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. Nobody gets tuberculosis unless they're <coughs> unless they are exposed to that. But that alone doesn't cause tuberculosis. So it's necessary but not sufficient. Because most people exposed to the bacillus don't become ill with the disease. Because the defense mechanisms of their body, the immune system, ward it off and they isolate. Uh, the uh, the bacteria or, or, or kill it. And we know that there are social and, and psychological <coughs> pardon me, causes of tuberculosis, poverty, uh, congested housing, uh, uh, lack of ability to afford medical care, lack of education, the, as to what the causes of tuberculosis are and so forth. So these are some of the social causes. And then there are psychological causes. People who suffer from alcoholism or some kind, some forms of, of drug addiction and so forth can be more vulnerable as well as other psychological problems. So I'm saying the same about violence. Shame and humiliation are the are necessary but not sufficient to cause violent behavior. When I say they're not sufficient, I mean in the sense that, you know, everybody, all of us have been shamed and humiliated at one time or another, and we continue to suffer experiences of embarrassment or, <coughs> or failure or, uh, you know, we've done, we've done something we're ashamed of. I mean, that, that occurs, to, you know, to one degree or another throughout life. Uh, and yet most of us never commit a serious act of violence in our, in our lifetime. So other causes must also uh, 
be necessary here, just as they are for tuberculosis. Uh, one of the, I'd say, the major necessary uh, conditions that make shame and humiliation especially productive of violent behavior is being a, a, a member of a uh, kind of looked down upon a uh, demographic group, a racial group, or a socioeconomic group, or what we call social class, where people are regarded by our society as of lower status. So socioeconomic status is really important. Our prisons are filled predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly with people who uh, have little education, they have poverty, often unemployment, uh, often sometimes they're homeless, uh, people who don't have any of the kind of social supports um, that we think of as, you know, what the middle class and upper class people have available. Uh, <coughs> a second major factor here is gender. Um, in our society and in all societies on earth, Violent behavior is mainly a male activity. Uh, in America, 85% uh, or so of murders are committed by men, and roughly uh, almost similar amount of the victims of murder are men. It's mainly violence of men against men. I'm talking about lethal violence. Uh, when you talk about suicide, 80% of suicides are committed by men. And of course, they're the perpetrator and the victim are the same. Wars throughout, from the beginning of the history of wars, going back to the Iliad and the earliest civilizations, wars have always been fought predominantly by men against other men. Uh, capital punishment. 95 to 99 percent of people who are given capital punishment are men. And they're often given it because they have killed other men. Sometimes they've killed women. What is true, of course, is that the, the main... Uh, Perpetrators of homicide against women are, are men. It's not other women. Um, so violence is mainly a male problem. And I would say the reason that men are so much more likely than women are to become violent, well, there's several reasons. One is that in all patriarchal societies, and frankly, almost all cultures on earth are patriarchal, they, they've uh, practiced male supremacy or misogyny and what we call sexism and so forth. But the way they define masculinity is, uh, among other things, that a man can only prove he's a man if he's willing to be violent under certain well-defined circumstances. Uh, the, well, again, going back to the earliest civilizations, uh, the the Latin word, uh, you know, from ancient Rome, for a man was vir, v-i-r, the root of our term virility and virile and so forth. Uh, but it also means soldier, because only men were soldiers, and uh, uh, soldiers were always men. To, you know, if you were born as a man, you were expected to be a soldier. So, in other words. And the reason men need uh, of the, that men are given that role, they are also expected to show courage, which is what you'd have to show to be a, have to be a soldier and kill other people, because uh, they're going to try to kill you in return to defend themselves, and so on. Um, so the words for masculinity, in a, both in Greek and Latin, uh, uh, also mean courage. They mean masculinity and they mean courage. So men are taught if they're not willing to be violent, they're not courageous. They are cowards uh, and non-men. Now, since I am a man, I think it would be understandable that that uh, everything I say about men and women might be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, so let me quote from a woman who I think was one of the most perceptive, psychologically perceptive, people of our time, that's the novelist Virginia Woolf, who wrote a wonderful polemic 
<coughs> uh, analyzing male violence. Uh, and uh, what she wrote about it was that the that the the most shameful thing you could say to a man would be to describe him as uh, lacking in courage, being a coward, or, or in 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 our our slang terms, a sissy or a wimp, that sort of thing. And uh, the most uh, shameful thing you could say about a woman is to attack her sexual what she called unchastity, like to call a woman a whore or a slut or a bitch and those things. Uh, I mean, that's the way men, you know, will insult women if they want to humiliate them. But men are humiliated if they're called a sissy, meaning they're not willing to fight. Even in the schoolyard, if a child is being bullied, he's taught to fight back. You know, he, he's not, he's losing his masculinity if he doesn't fight. So men are taught that to be masculine and adequate as males, they've got to be willing to be violent. Uh, only men fought duels with each other. If one man insulted another, he would be obligated, he'd be required to challenge the other person to fight a duel because otherwise he would be shamed and humiliated and lose his honor forever and the honor of his family even. So, you know, duels are fought by men just as wars are. Um, so, uh, I'd say that the, the sexism and patriarchy of our society and the socioeconomic inequalities of our society, these cultural and social and economic and political conditions are really the, the, the much most powerful uh, sources of the shaming that in turn leads to violence. So let, let me give an example. Uh, I, I, one of the books I wrote, I, I discovered one year that the rates of suicide and homicide in our society, uh, which, had, which go up or down at different decades, different years, uh, the homicide and suicide rate parallel each other. They go up and down together. Well, what I discovered, uh, and I was not expecting or anticipating this, was that the rates of homicide and suicide in our society since 1900, so we have 120 years of data, have gone up when Republicans were in the White House and have gone down when Democrats were in the White House to a degree that is very, uh, statistically significant. I mean, this whatever this is, it's not uh, a coincidence. It's it's really uh, a, a, a dramatically it, it, the fact that it would be due to chance is almost non-existent. However, there are three socioeconomic mechanisms that I would say lead to the shame that individuals feel, which leads them to become violent, namely unemployment economic inequality and recessions and depressions, which are all kind of interrelated phenomena. I mean, they, are, they coexist. There are different ways of describing the same thing. But what, what I found was that in every single Republican administration since 1900, without a single exception, the unemployment rate and the duration of unemployment has gone up. And under every single Democratic administration, it's gone down. Now, I'm not saying the Democrats have created a utopia here. The, the record of uh, liberal or left-wing parties in Western Europe is, is much better than the Democrats have ever achieved in this country. So we still have a long way to go. Nevertheless, relatively speaking, just comparing our two major political parties, it's clear that right-wing parties increase the level of violence in our society and the relatively more left-wing uh, society decre uh, party decreases it, and that there are recognizable socioeconomic mechanisms that can explain that. It gets ever increasingly gratifying to hear someone of, of your stature with your experience and, and your skill sets say to the world, hey, this is what we should be looking at. And on that note, um, I've long said 
that uh, and and always uh, with with uh, with a, re- a negative response um, from the people who hear it uh, that the patriarchy it created the environment we are now suffering in. Um, and I, I wonder, from your perspective, what would you say? Uh, to what degree can we um, attribute the fault to the patriarchy of what we're seeing today with mass shootings? Essentially, uh, these mass shootings, in particular, that we're witnessing, um, is that a symptom of the patriarchy collapsing in on itself? And to what degree will that play a role in the collapse of society as a whole? Now, the the role of patriarchy here is, for one thing. If you think about it, almost all the mass shootings are committed by men. You know, there are there are very seldom a woman who who is committing these things. Secondly, uh, after one of the uh, school shootings, I was called by the lawyer for the child who had shot up a school and killed classmates and teachers, and he said, "My client just walked right out of your book on on violence. You know, would you you know consult with me about it?" And and he was right. Uh, I mean, but I'd say this has been true of every every multiple murder that I've heard of, the, about which we have enough information even to uh, uh, to uh, assert that. And that is that people who do this feel they are being shamed and humiliated. I mean, this man's clan just, you know, both in interviews with him and uh, you know his his diary and notes and so forth overwhelmingly showed how he felt rejected, teased, humiliated, you know, by, by his classmates and teachers and even his parents and so on. Uh, the, uh, the, the Columbine school shooting, these children that did that. By the way, almost all the mass murderers either kill themselves or they're killed by the police. And they essentially expect to be killed by the police. The, the young man that the lawyer called me about was surprised that the police hadn't killed him. He, he, he embarked on this mass massacre assuming he'd be shot and killed by the police. That was part of his plan. Uh, one thing I learned from the most violent people that I worked with in the prisons over and over again, and this is something I had not heard from anybody. I hadn't read it anywhere. It's just what I they taught me. They would say, that they, their goal in life and death was to go to their own death in a hail of gunfire, but only after killing as many other people as possible first. And uh, that to them, that was dying in a blaze of glory. They'd be proving their courage, their masculinity, that they were so courageous that they would be willing to, to go down uh, uh, to their own deaths uh, and by and also in a context where they showed how powerful they were, they had the power over life and death. If you look at the uh, suicide bombers, that's another version of a mass murderer who uh, goes to his own death by the very means by which he kills people. Uh, I, in some of my writings, I've quoted the uh, observation of a Palestinian uh, Arab psychiatrist uh, in in uh, in, in Israel, in the, in the Gaza Strip, who, who uh, concurred with that. He said that the reason uh, many Palestinians were doing you know, like suicide bombings and stuff was they felt humiliated. They felt shamed by the way they were being treated uh, uh, in Israel. And he said shame is the most painful emotion uh, that, that, that in their culture, not, but I'd say in almost all cultures, it's the most, one of the most painful emotions. And uh, so, uh, I mean, I could give you dozens of examples from all over the world, but I saw this in the prisons. Certainly one thing that humiliates people to that degree is when they are being punished. Uh, What I learned in the prisons, I would see this day after day. I ran prison mental health programs at the prison mental hospital in Massachusetts and so on. So I saw these things on a day-to-day basis, the more severely the prisoners were punished, the more violent they would become. And it, was a, it would be a vicious cycle between the prison guards and the prisoners. And uh, uh, what would happen is it would escalate to the point where the prisoner would be just willing to go to his own death uh, if, if that was what it took to get back at the people who had humiliated him and treated him like dirt 
as they as they experienced it. Um, James, I'd like to I'd like to weigh in real quick on the school shooting phenomenon because it's it's something that's really feels personal to me because I in high school uh, felt a lot of shame and isolation. I had very few friends. I can really actually relate to a lot of those chil- with those of those children, except in the violent urges. I didn't have a violent impulse in me. Thankfully, I took things out of myself instead of taking them out on other people. But I, I just, I remember uh, a few days ago or weeks ago, it was a school shooting. And I saw someone on Twitter post, like some journalist was like, I was there and my, I lost my kids in there. Or, like we got separated and I had to duck. And, and he said, basically like some people are just losers. Some people are just, are just, you know, not successful and they take it on other people. And it was just like, so bitterly yeah. ironic that this person is basically doubling yeah. down on the very faculty, the very uh, force that pushes people into this position. That in schools they are a there's like a, an interesting cultural trickle down effect. Like trickle down economics, of course, doesn't right. work at all. You know, you, only an idiot would think that it does after decades of of that not working and just the obviousness of the insanity of the whole yeah. oppression and cultural attitudes trickle down. So we have this the social hierarchy at the top. I think the school is a perfect example of that because it's not really a marketplace in a way. It's not like the economic policies trickle down, but the social hierarchies yeah. totally reflect the oh, economic absolutely. hierarchies. And that inequality, the inequality of like there being popular kids that are successful and kids with good grades that are that are embraced in that way. And then you have these losers, these untouchables out in out in the schools that are just ridiculed ridiculed and and you know because a lot of for a lot of people in the middle that's the only way that they can get up. That's the only way that they can make their inadequacies yeah. less apparent is by pointing at these weak individuals and calling them losers. So it's just, it's just so hurtful to see people so totally misunderstand what's going on. And they just say, Oh, well, some people are just evil. And a, a, a really good friend, this old uh, teacher friend of mine said, anybody tells you that, that these kids are to blame for this or shames them or calls them evil. He said, listen, you coward, how dare you, how dare you blame the victims of your failed society for ultimately what is our fault for creating and perpetuating this this cycle, this society that makes it so that children are killing children. I mean, we live in such a distorted, warped society, and none of the responses have been sane or – they've been more guns, more walls, make school more of a prison. Yeah, no, you yeah, absolutely – I would actually like to piggyback on that a little bit too. This is something that I was kind of revisiting. I, I just finished a book that's kind of, you know, ba- you know, this subject about violence is, is a, is a, a, a good portion of it. Um, you know, I, I was kind of examining, you know, the, the, the causal feedback loops in the incarceration system essentially. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of two sides of the same coin because on one hand you're putting people in a system that punishes them, that, that uh, you know, shames them to an extreme degree. Uh, it also takes away a portion of their life where they could be utilizing that time, that energy, that focus to better themselves, uh, to learn, to grow and things like that. But the resources that, uh, you know, are put forth in that entire system in the incarceration system are also taking away from the very resources that could go to their communities in order to help those communities communities and uh, provide those people with the things that they need. And, and so it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. On one hand, on one hand, the incarceration system takes people away from that, from, you know, their families, from their homes, from their community, from the actual environment that would be beneficial to help them improve. And on the other hand, it's also taking away resources from that community and putting them into a detrimental thing. On the other hand, that just completely magnifies and worsens the problem. And, uh, and so it's just this, you know, reinforcing feedback loop. These re- these resources keep on going to the incarceration system instead of the communities, instead of the resources that could actually be helping these people. And it's just this this cycle that keeps on going and going and going and getting worse and worse and worse with with every pass. So I, I just kind of totally to I agree that. with everything that that the two of you have said. I I think you're absolutely right. Let me just say, let me start with uh, the first thing that Zachary said. When I was running these prison mental health programs, we would often have staff meetings involving uh, psychiatrists, but also involving prison administrators or prison guards and so forth. When we'd be discussing, you know, some particular uh, inmate who's, uh, you know, continuing violence that they didn't understand. They didn't know what to do about it, what was causing it. And, uh, and, and then one of them would pipe up and say, he must just be evil. And what struck me is people use the word evil when they don't understand what's causing the behavior. 
I mean, it's easy for us to call somebody mm-hmm. evil. That's a label. It's a definition. But it's not an explanation. It, it doesn't explain anything. Why, did the, why is the person doing something that we call evil or that we judge to be evil? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the important question. Right. Now, yeah, it, oh, I'm sorry, just go ahead. Say, I'll let you continue. What I've discovered is that the cause of the behavior that we label as evil or sinful or criminal uh, is being humiliated by other people, treated as inferior, treated with contempt, uh, and so on. Mm. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, to get to, to the last point yeah, that you made is that the mass incarceration in America has gotten so extreme that many states have been spending more money on their prisons than on their colleges and universities. Uh, and uh, in California, in California, so prison officers uh, are, are paid more than the, than the professors in the universities. But the whole prison system costs more than, you know, what is one of the best university systems in, the, in not just the country, but the world. So you're absolutely right. Mm. Then more than that, I think, when I think of the degree to which we are spending and wasting billions of dollars on prisons, which are counterproductive, they're, they're causing more violence than they're preventing. Uh, but if we spent that same amount of money on programs to develop a welfare state or a social democracy with a greater degree of uh, economic equality, uh, not only would the rate of violence go down, but the, the, uh, the cost uh, of the prisons would disappear. For example, I did a 10 year uh, violence prevention uh, experiment in the jails of San Francisco, working uh, specifically exclusively with violent offenders. We had them in, a, in an, an intensive program of psychotherapy and education and all kinds of other uh, programs where they would uh, hear from victims of violence. They would write plays about their own lives and what had turned them toward a life of violence. Just all kinds of imaginative programs. They were in programs six days a week, 12 hours a day while they were in prison. The result was that the uh, rate of violence within the jails went to zero for a year at a time. And the rate of reoffending after they left the jails was down 83%. I mean, violent reoffending was down 83% compared to uh, uh, virtually identical, <coughs> pardon me, virtually identical inmates in an ordinary jail. Now, this program cost more money because we had so many people running it than, than an ordinary jail. However, the program itself <coughs> saved the taxpayers four dollars for every dollar spent on it because the rate of reincarceration of reoffending, you know, was so much less. And, you know, very few things are more expensive than keeping somebody in a prison or jail for a year. We used to say that a year in jail would pay for a year in Yale. And it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. It's easily the same, sometimes even more expensive. Uh, so you're absolutely right when you say that we are, we're, we're wasting money on something that is counterproductive and is only producing more violence when we could be spending, you know, that money or less even, and and coming up with programs that would would make the community safer, as well as saving money for the taxpayers. Absolutely. Another really interesting thing too that um, you know, that I hadn't thought of too much is the whole respect thing, and um, that's interesting that you bring that up too, because I mean, it makes so much sense, especially when you factor yeah. in inequality. Uh, I mean, imagine imagine what it would feel like, you know, if if you are uh, you know, somebody that, that doesn't really have your basic needs met yeah. on a regular basis. Yet here you are living in a country where, you know, j- a lot of people do, you know, and, and just the socioeconomic system itself is keeping you from doing, yeah. from, from meeting your needs in a lot of ways. I mean, that t- to me just speaks disrespect yeah. in and of itself. Just just the system itself is is a system that does not promote respect or equality and things like that. And, and it makes so much sense because it's, it's like a mechanism, you know, like it's people get decision fatigue and things like that. Well, you know, if, if you, if you have to, 
you know, control yourself time and time and time again, because you feel disrespected in so many different ways in your life, then eventually yeah. you're probably going to snap. Right. And it, it, it's like, it's just d your defense mechanism gets worn out yeah. after a while. Right. Because you don't have, because you don't really have your basic needs met, you know, or you, or you don't have as many opportunities or things like that. And um, I mean, re in this case, the respect really is just, you know, being able to meet your basic needs and have those opportunities. And it has a lot to do with the environment that, that people are in. And, you know, that, that lack of, security and just you know community and opportunity and everything else that i'm sure a lot of these people see and other more affluent communities on a regular basis too so they're comparing what they have to a lot of what uh, you know what more affluent uh, communities have and and there's you know that that's where the inequality comes and and probably a lot of resentment you know disrespectful you know feelings even shame things like that then throw in this whole other dynamic with, you know, oh, you don't, you know, yeah. deserve it, you know, from the from this whole right wing point of view. And uh, I mean, God, it's just a recipe yeah. for disaster, yeah. in my opinion. Um, what I hear you saying for me translates into a lack of respect for yeah. human life. Like, I think that translates more directly into recognition of the value, the innate value of human life. And so in meeting our basic needs, that would be recognized. And in preventing us from doing that with paywalls and status quos and, and comp you know, competitive games, um, we, we are devaluing human life at a fundamental level. And, it's, and, and then you know, we have what we have to communicate with. We have our, our dialogue, and, and it goes along the lines of this superiority inferiority um, uh, dynamic and so respect comes into play quote unquote but i think it's really just a matter of recognition i was just going to say yeah i mean the entire society is based upon yeah. win-lose competition so you can't have not a loser you can't have an, an equal society as you said beautifully in the, the uh, interviews we got for the film that capitalism is yeah. based on inequality because it doesn't matter if you're rich yeah. if you're not richer than somebody else and so I just want to say that the entire structure of our society is a punishment. I mean, wage labor was originally instituted to punish yeah. rebellious people or rebel or people who were youngsters who were uh, a little too wily or who were doing crimes or women who, who wouldn't settle down into the marriage. It was used as a punishment. And it was used, as my good friend, uh, Professor Jeff Cates pointed out, as, as a means of crushing the rebelliousness and the critical thinking of whole civilizations of this society of working for this paltry wage. And of, of our whole society is this giant open air prison calling where we are not really free to do what we want. I mean, you mentioned inequality. The Federal Reserve right now is actually working to jack up unemployment because this, you know, uh, the million people dying through COVID and all the other just system failures that have pushed people away from the desire to want to work, to want to participate in this bullshit system. I mean, they, they really want to increase the pain and difficulty in people's lives just so that they, it's just so crazy they're trying to make life harder to punish people because being poor is a punishment Absol absolutely it's one of the worst punishments uh, uh i mean and people have been commenting on that <laughs> ever since society got divided into the rich and the poor once we did once we invented civilization when the whole social class system got started but uh let me mention one thing that uh, to refer back to something you said, Zachary, when you mentioned that uh, you had experienced, uh, you know, a, a lot of, of humiliation and shame, but did not become violent. And what I would what, like to emphasize, I've talked a lot about shame, but let me also talk about the, the capacity for feelings of guilt and remorse about hurting other people. That is something that, that tends to get well, let me say, you have to be treated with a certain amount of respect by other people and a certain amount of love in order to develop the capacity to feel guilt or remorse about hurting others. Uh, you empathize with them if, you've, uh, if people have empathized with you and have treated you with respect. And what struck me is what, what you showed, Zachary, in, in your description is that you had the capacity to inhibit or, uh, you know, just to not experience the rush of violent impulses that the people that wind up in the prison do. And uh, that, that's a matter of character development, that you develop the capacity to empathize with people and say, no, I'm not going to hurt them. Uh, 
so I think uh, the, the the concept of, of guilt as as the opposite of shame is is central here. Um, Freud said once that nobody feels guiltier than the saints, and then he was he was right. Uh, if you read their autobiographies or biographies, they're you know forever saying oh, mea culpa, mea culpa, you know my sin, my crime, uh, and they feel too guilty to, to hurt a butterfly. What I learned in the prison was something that. I worked with a population Freud never saw, and that was violent criminals in prisons. What I learned was that nobody feels more innocent than the criminals. And that's what, what makes it possible for them to commit the kinds of violent crimes, the murders and multiple murders and so forth that we see. They, instead of feeling uh, guilt, they feel pride in being able to have that amount of power over other people. I just, I just want to read this. Uh, actually, it's, I have this page of your book, oh. Violence, opened up, which I rec anybody needs to read this book. Really, it's a, it's a book of fundamental importance into an issue that it literally affects every single one of us. It's one of the most profound, prime uh, books about just something that is invisible and everywhere. But yeah, I'm on the page where you literally said that exact sentence here. But I wanted to read this sentence, and it's, uh, the most violent people are incapable, oh sorry, what is most startling about the most violent people is how incapable they are, at least at the yep. time they commit their violence, of feeling love, guilt, or fear. The psychology of shame explains this. The person who is overwhelmed by feelings of shame is by definition experiencing a psychically life-threatening lack of love. And someone in that condition has no love left over for anyone else. And that, that really just is so powerful to me. And I have to think about applying the standards that we think about behavioral violence to those who are committing yeah. structural violence. And, you know, thinking about the pride that someone has in the amount of exploitation that yeah. they're committing, in the amount of of profit that they're making in the ways that they're making this system worse. I mean, you have someone like Donald Trump who would openly brag about yeah. fucking people over, you know? I mean, that's yeah. the whole business world. That's you can't win without getting over yeah. on someone else. And this this is ultimately a structural issue. That's why it's structural yeah. violence. You said that again in our interview that the people committing these acts don't know what they're doing. And so I see the hatred and any the, just the, the deep burning loathing an injustice that so many poor people feel for someone like Jeff Bezos or politicians or billionaires, when it, in reality, I have to understand that those people aren't doing this on purpose, that it seems like they're just evil. How could they not know how badly they're hurting us? How could they not know how unjust and unequal this is? They do know. Yeah. It's coming from a place of pain. They're victims yeah. of the system yeah. creating more victims. No, I think that's true. That, I think the, you know, as long as there's no limit to how rich somebody can get, uh, there's an endless quest for superiority right. and, and for pride. Yeah, yeah. So right. I paid yeah. my dues. So that, you know, <laughs> you, know that you have yeah. the, this absurd contest between the richest people on earth to become the richest. You know, it's like I have the biggest bank account in the world. I won't even suggest what that is a symbol of, but I have the biggest in the world. That, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, as long as that happens. Now, let me mention uh, one thing. The period in, in the past hundred years when we had the lowest rates of violence in America, of homicide and suicide, were when we had the highest marginal income tax rate was as high as 94%, meaning that we had not just a minimum wage, we also had a maximum wage. So that, that was the, when we had the highest degree of economic equality in our country. I mean, it still wasn't as good as it should have been. It could have been. But what I will say is that got diminished radically once the Republicans came back into power after Roosevelt, Truman, uh, and a, a rhino, a Republican in name only called Eisenhower, and then Kennedy and Johnson. Uh, go ahead, Zachary. You. So, in keeping with that trend of the, you know the greater the uh, distribution of wealth, the greater the equality, the less violence, the more holistic uh, health within a society, the greater public health there is. I think that really brings us to really the the function of our show and our movement, and what we're trying to really get people to understand is that this unequal market monetary system really is the problem. So, um, James, it, uh, I think it's it's funny that. Um, I was introduced to you through a film called Zeitgeist Moving Forward that uh, you were interviewed for, I yeah. believe, about a decade ago. And I asked you about it uh, when, it, when we were, I was interviewing you, and you, I mentioned a resource-based economy, all these things, and you were just like, uh, I'm not really familiar with that. I haven't said it. You guys are like, oh, I've been to so many movies. I haven't seen them all. And I was like, oh, you haven't seen that? And I explained the concept to you, and you're like, oh, yes, yes, yes. So you actually yeah. uh, watched that movie 
um, between before this episode. So I would really love to hear your uh, general thoughts and feedback and just how it how it sort of struck you as a pathway to solutions. Well, what I what I said in that uh, that film, and I would repeat strongly today, is I think the main cause of violence is inequality, and the main way to prevent violence is to create a more equal world where people are treated as equal. Uh, the way you know <laughs> our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution supposedly say we're supposed to treat each other uh, as you know, all, all men are created equal, but we now say all men and women are created equal. They, they meant, they meant That's all right, white exactly. slave owning. All white owners. men with capital. Exactly, exactly. Property exactly. owners, yes. The patriarchy. That's absolutely <laughs> right. Oh, there's no question about it. Uh, but if, you know, so historically, we've failed to live up to that. What we've been, you know, make, people have been making an effort ever since to fill in the blank and, and, uh, 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 to create a more e egalitarian society. What I would say is this, is uh, in order to understand the social causes of, of violence, I've uh, I used the anthropologist terms of shame cultures and guilt cultures. Uh, for a shame culture is one where the uh, kind of the ethos of the culture is based on the wish to uh, uh, diminish your shame to the maximum and increased your level of pride, uh, which you can do by shaming other people or by proving that you're superior to other people. So that tends to create a hierarchical, unequal society, which is very violent. And uh, a guilt culture is much more based on wishing to have people be uh, equal so that you're not guilty of exploiting other people or having advantages they don't have and so forth which would cause a person with a conscience to, to feel guilty about the difference. So uh, the uh, many psychologists, I, I would I join them in this, would say that right wing politics is motivated by shame and an absence of guilt feelings. And left wing politics is much more motivated by uh, the capacity to feel guilt and remorse about hurting others and by the capacity for love and compassion toward the suffering of other people and the wish to 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 heal the wounds they've suffered. And let me give two examples. Uh, I'd say the the uh, example of a shame culture and, and of how the Republican Party, a right wing party, uh, is based on trying to uh, increase pride for the people at the top and shame for those at the bottom. I would quote what Ronald Reagan said when he said about the Republican Party, we're a party that wants this country always to be a place where somebody can get rich. Well, being rich means that you are richer than other people. The word has no meaning otherwise. So to, be, to have more people rich means you have more relative poverty, i.e. more shame and i.e. more violence, which is exactly what we have witnessed hmm. since Reagan you know, came into power. And the Republican Party has even uh, you know, built on that. The opposite was something Franklin Roosevelt said in his first inaugural address. He said, you can judge the worth of a society not by what it does for those who already have much, but what it does for those who have too little. In other words, he was saying, we've got to pay attention to the people who have been neglected and who have suffered, who have been impoverished, not given equal opportunities. But what I think is we need more than just equality of opportunity. We need equality of outcome because there's no equality of opportunity if you don't have equality of outcome. For example, a child who inherits nothing from the parents when they die cannot possibly have the same opportunity as a child who inherits a million dollars or a billion dollars. I mean, the concept of equality of opportunity is just it's fraudulent. It's dishonest to speak of that when we when we have such inequalities uh, in in our inheritance system. Uh, I, I would uh, really support a one hundred percent inheritance tax, so that everybody who died their hmm. in their their capital would go into uh, a fund for the entire country, and then all the funds that guarantee you know 
came about would be distributed equally to everybody in the country. Uh, so I did say 100% inheritance tax. You know, people could hold on to some you know, personal property, but basically the idea would be to, to undo the, these massive in, uh, inequalities in, in wealth. And I said the same thing about the income taxes. I said, our lowest degrees of violence in this country occurred when the income tax rate was at its highest. And when the income tax rate went down, the rates of homicide and suicide went up. Because you're having what you're having is more and more people are being humiliated. Poverty humiliates people. Downward social mobility uh, and, uh, it humiliates people. If people lose their job and become unemployed, as happens under every Republican administration, there's there's almost nothing more shameful than to be fired from your job. And people can lose their homes, their savings, become homeless. Not 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 for me. Those are always <laughs> the happiest days. Oh, I get to go yeah. home. I get yeah. I get a, I get yeah. a check and yeah. I get to yeah. leave. Yeah. Hell yeah! I, I I didn't mean to interrupt here, but I I wanted to um get your your um, perspective on basically moving toward a society that does not that is not based upon these yeah. inequalities that is not based upon these structures that can continually uh, ratchet us towards this violent dangerous unstable condition I just I had this thought the other day I was I was thinking of of how to pitch a sustainable world where all wealth is shared equally to the richest person in society and I thought this was a very sharp insight that the per, the richest person in the world or the richest class of people in the world may have 10 cars and a jet that allows them to go anywhere in the world, but they're still fundamentally constrained to about 1% yeah, yeah. or less of the planet because they can't openly interact with those people who have nothing flashing their million dollar watch or their car. They can't go into the slums. And I would consider those the best places where the people are the most joyous and the most sharing and giving and dancing and laughing and making, you know, creating. That's where, that's where the party's at really. But so the, the rich people can only experience a very small amount of the world because of the instability that, they, that their wealth extraction has created. The violence, the public health threat, that if we care at all about public health, about the health of the collective organism, we cannot have a system that is based upon and must, uh, you know, have an unequal uh, distribution of wealth for it to function. So I think we really absolutely need to transition to a system that isn't based on, you know, scarcity, yeah, yeah. that isn't based on money, that isn't based on markets and trade and competition, and transition towards the equal ownership. Of, I, of wealth. I could not agree more. And uh, I, 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 one reason this is so important in the modern world. Uh, I mean, this goes way beyond what I've experienced personally, but I, can, I can't help but see it based on what I've experienced personally. I think that we are at a period in our history where the human species is at risk of becoming the first species in the history of evolution to render itself extinct by means of its own behavior rather than because of changes in the natural environment that are beyond its power to control. Because uh, <clears throat> we now live in a world of thermonuclear weapons and we live in a world of climate change or global warming. And either or both of those, they've never been more of a danger than they are right now. I mean, after all, we have Vladimir Putin expressing, you know, threatening to use nuclear weapons. We have Kim Jong-un in North Korea, threat, you know, threatening to use nuclear weapons. We have Donald Trump when he was president saying, what use are nuclear weapons if we can't use them? I mean, in other words, we have people from across the, the world, national leaders who have these weapons threatening to use them. And we all know how the Republican Party is doing everything possible to increase nuclear, uh, uh, thermon I mean, uh, to increase climate warming and, and climate change. Uh, so. I, my conclusion. Well, well, Jim, we, we paid a lot of money for those nuclear weapons. We just right, wanted to go exactly. Waste. <laughs> but I think you could say really without exaggeration, this is not a uh, speculation or a uh, theory. It's just what the data shows. The Republican Party is the party of death in America. And the Democratic Party relative to the Republican Party is much more the party of life. It, it's not it's not anywhere near where we need to go. It's way behind the countries of Western Europe, and even they are behind where we as a species need to go, although they've gone further than, than 
any other mm -hmm. societies we have. I heard, a, I heard a really good analogy the other day, actually, that was the Republican Party is the school yeah. shooter and the, the Democratic Party is the police who uh, are outside <laughs> waiting 45 minutes before yeah, they do anything yeah. to act. And then they go yeah. in and maybe shoot a that kid and then is, hide their that's body. Really true. True. That's really true. I also, um, I, what I, I, two things about that I'd say is, you know, if anything, you know, this destroys the myth that uh, uh, AR-15 rifles, you know, are the equivalent of handguns. I think that that school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, you know, should should break down that myth. And the other myth is that if you have good guys with guns, that'll solve the problem of bad guys with guns. Clearly, it, it don't work that way. And and I thought again that that one uh, ex, uh, event uh, really demonstrated those those facts. But the Republican Party is the party that supports not only that everybody should have a gun. What's it? The reason they need a gun is so they can, they can shoot and kill people, because this is based on a paranoid worldview, the view that I'm surrounded by enemies who are out to kill me, and I need to kill them first in order to survive. And to do that, I need a gun, especially a gun with a, you know, a big magazine that can shoot thirty bullets in ten seconds and so forth. <clears throat> well, to speak to the myth there, that our Central American myth is the myth yeah. of the cowboy, yeah. and what is the cowboy? You know. He got Clint Eastwood wandering around a, a, a lifeless wasteland <laughs> with no ability to feed himself, with no yeah. skills. He's not farming. He's not growing. He's not. He's got a fucking gun, and he, and he goes around and kills people to get everything that he wants. That's all he has. He's not yeah. even wearing a backpack. He just has a horse yeah. and a fucking gun, and he takes what he wants, yeah. and that's America, you know, across the board. When in reality, you look at the actual cowboys, a lot of them were black, yeah. a lot of them were brown or indigenous, and they traveled yeah. in groups. They were communists. Essentially, they went. They shared what they yeah. had together, or they wouldn't have yeah. made it across yeah. those dangerous regions. And if and if one of them said, "Hey, uh, I'm going to get all the food, and you guys don't eat until I do," they would fucking kill him, yeah. or they would yeah. all die. You know, and that's just the, <laughs> it's just the reality of it. No, that's true. And uh, you know, people often uh, make the mistake of equating uh, communism with totalitarianism, but in fact. It's the, the communist societies that were the least violent in history. I, I, by the way, I would say Stalin's Russia, it was not what I would call a communist society. I agree with uh, Milovan Jalas, the, uh, 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 the kind of protege of Tito in Yugoslavia, who got thrown in prison by Tito because of what he said was they had just simply created a new class. They hadn't created a classless society. But the societies that have been classless, mm -hmm. Uh, have been the least violent in history. I, I go back to the the uh, communism of, of the hunting and gathering and foraging societies. I talk about the early Christian communities, which clearly divided the wealth equally among them. The, the, the idea was uh, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. That's the way the, uh, the, the, the early Christians lived. They stopped that once Constantine became... Uh, converted to Christianity, they made Christianity the religion of the upper class rather than of the poor and the slaves, which is where it started out. But again, mm -hmm. communism continued in the, in the monasteries and convents and among some of the pacifist uh, Anabaptist groups at the time of the, Re the, Re the Reformation, like the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites, where they have communism. Uh, on, in, uh, in Israel, the, the kibbutzim practiced uh, sharing of the wealth and they were the least violent parts of Israel society. Their criminal justice system used to refer violent criminals to live in a kibbutz so they could learn how to be nonviolent. And uh, in, in, in this country, uh, as I've said, the, the, the closest we've come to nonviolence is when we really came the closest to, uh, to diminishing the level of, of inequality in our society. Again, we haven't gone nearly far enough, ideally, I think the ideal would be to, well, again, that old principle, which is, uh, I'd say goes back to early, really Judaism and Christianity. It's Christianity was just a Judaism, J Jewish sect. Uh, but but uh, uh, Jesus was simply quoting uh, other rabbis in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't originate those. Uh, so that was a Judeo-Christian ethic, 
which really eventuated in communism. And that was where people really treated each other with love and respect and sharing and equality. And to the degree that we could arrange in the modern world to create a world like that, I think that may be our only way to avoid, frankly, rendering ourselves extinct by our out of control violence, which is stimulated by the, the uh, shame that is caused by inequality and relative poverty and racial discrimination and uh, male supremacy and all these forms of hierarchy and inequality that really stimulate violence. Preach, brother. Preach. I, 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 you know, <laughs> I'm not an economist, but I would ask those who are to really collaborate uh, uh, with each other and with me and others like me to try to help us find out how we could create a really uh, egalitarian, economically egalitarian society. Because I think we may need to do, learn how to do that, I would say, before World War III, hopefully, rather than after World War III. So we have a few ideas for that. Um, the, what, what, what the, obviously, we've uh, you know kind of piggybacked off the whole uh, TZM TVP resource-based economy idea that you saw in the uh, the Zeitgeist Addendum uh, movement. What we're trying to do as an organization, as Moneyless Society, is essentially is create a network of uh, cooperatives of equal ownership, kind of democratically run cooperatives, um, and through this network of cooperatives, each cooperative can kind of start. Uh, essentially providing its members with different aspects of daily life, right? So one cooperative could, you know, work on clothing, another could work on housing, another could work on agriculture and food and things like that. And throughout a network of cooperatives, essentially what we would like to do is combine them uh, to provide what we would like to call a system for universal right. basic goods and services. And, and um, as opposed, a lot of people have heard of the concept of universal yeah. basic income at this point from Andrew Yang and the whole similar movement. So we're just like, why do we need income? Just give people sure. what they need. Right. And and so, you know, it's it's a pretty self-explanatory term that I think we've kind of settled on at this point. Universal basic goods and services. People can kind of hear that and grasp what it what it is. And um, so so we're kind of trying to promote that concept a bit uh, just throughout and throughout the formation of a network of cooperatives, essentially to form this system uh, to provide its members uh, with universal basic goods and services. And this is kind of a long term goal that we have as an organization that we would like to collaborate with other people, with other organizations, uh, you know, to create this system, you know, one piece at a time, one step at a time through, you know, multiple organizations, people, companies, cooperatives, all that coming together, you know, making plans, developing and, you know, kind of in, in, in creating these kind of like work, live, play communities, really, or even habitats like Travis Grant on the call, uh, you know, really kind of narrowed it down because, you know, a community is kind of has more boundaries a habitat is more of a you know ongoing inclusive sort of thing and and i like that distinction that he made too so that that was good a good conversation that we had with him the other day too um but yeah, so that's kind of the direction that we're heading as an organization, the idea that we're really trying to get out there and, uh, you know, just get other people on board with this idea. If we can if we can start creating businesses, I mean, these will be essentially businesses that operate within the capitalist structure, but they're kind of, you know, insulated to a degree because they have this equal ownership democratically democratic structure of the cooperative yeah. embedded in them and you know from that point we feel like that's a pretty solid basis uh that we can at least an entity formation that we can you know utilize at this point to create these structures and then you know build on that from there so so as an as an organization that's kind of the goal or idea and, and where we're heading and we like to have these conversations through the podcast to try to educate these people about these things i mean just the public in general General, um, as well as other people that may not, you know, be familiar with us as an organization and our goals and, and values and what we're doing, you know, our long term mission and things like that. So I, essentially, our long term goal is kind of by the year 2030, we're hoping to have, uh, you know, just kind of a system of cooperatives that at least begins to resemble this system of universal basic yeah. goods and services that it can maybe at least in part provide to some of its members. And, and we feel like that's maybe at least a good starting point. So 
that, that, sounds, that's kind of what we're doing. Hmm? It sounds like it would fall within your primary preventative measures, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Gilligan, that you had spoken previously in, about in other interviews. And if I might paraphrase one thing you said that really um, uh, resonated with me, uh, and you've, you've basically stated it in various ways in today's conversation, and that is that uh, to reduce the amount of economic and social inequality yeah. is where we should begin, such as we would be trying to do with uh, the plan that Matt expounded on, and uh, that inequality is the most powerful predictor of violence yeah. throughout the world. Absolutely, and I think I think the the idea of uh, cooperatives that, that is an example of what I was earlier calling communism. I mean, it's just a communal sharing of the wealth, and uh, saying we're all in this together. We're going to treat each other as equals. Uh, given that, I mean. Yes, some people may need, uh, for example, if you're sick, you'll need some things that somebody isn't sick doesn't need. But the point is to be, uh, to, to be, to respond to people's needs with whatever the community has that it has shared as a as a common, you know, uh, basis of their of their wealth. And uh, I, I'd say that throughout history, uh, human social groups organized in that way have been the least violent in our history. And I think we, we, we need to discover how to implement that on as wide a scale as possible if we are going to succeed in really in avoiding what, you know, could be a disaster, not just the worst disaster in the history, but a disaster that could end history. Um, An existential absolutely. event. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite amazing what the... Uh, sort of parasitic organization of corporations have accomplished in a few hundred years. You know, the corporation, as we know, it has only existed for around 200 years. And, you know, these groups of people coming together and in a way, a fucked up pyramidal way, sharing their power and wealth and resources have conquered the world. And so we need to work on <laughs> stepping outside of the existing system and basically giving up the ghost that this system is going to outmode itself. That it's going to support a transitional structure that it is founded against. I mean, the the foundation of the Constitution and of the American experiment. I mean, I, I think about, I can't remember. I think it was maybe Madison, or Adams, or one of those one of those sort of more Republican types who said that the purpose of government is to protect the minority of the opulent uh, against yeah. the majority of the poor, and and so protecting property rights at the yeah. expense of human rights is what this system is based upon. And so I think that that kind of brings us into the necessity in some ways while we work on this walkout and this, this walk away into this more efficient, more egalitarian, more e ecological structure, this healthier, less violent, less equal, happier, more joyful and love-based system. It, I think that there will come a, a, a time where conflict with the existing system needs to happen. And we talked a little bit about on, on camera about the nonviolent resistance that has occurred and nonviolent regime changes. And, and we didn't actually have time in, when we uh, spoke or filmed to go into more detail on those. But I, I'm curious, in your research, in your experience, uh, what are methods of, of regaining power and con, you know, basically stepping, standing against violent systems of oppression that people have utilized in the past that have been successful? Oh, boy. I, I, I think the question of how to apply these principles and succeed given the realities of our political uh, and economic system. <clears throat> that is the, you know, the $64 trillion question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I can only say that I think, you know, we, we, we need to be able to try to s speak with each other, even with people we disagree with and who disagree with us with respect, trying to share what we share in common. Um, I, I think it's important, you know, we speak a lot of, uh, I spoke a lot about inequalities in wealth, but you know, there are some some people who are independently wealthy uh, who, who did see the need for change. I mean, after all, Franklin Roosevelt was independently wealthy. Uh, and yet- yeah. didn't, didn't he get elected four times? Yeah, he got elected times four too. times, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, and again, he he was not able to develop even a, a, a real welfare state the way countries in Europe did after World War Two. Uh, uh, but and they tried yeah, to coup yeah. him, by the way, 
They tried. They tried to get uh, Smedley yeah. Butler, the uh, general General Smedley Butler, to become their fascist overlord. The corporations were yeah. so threatened by yeah. even a mild, uh, really, what that's, saving that, capital, right. keeping that's the exactly machine going, right. yeah. 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 that they would have. They would have. Yeah. They would have taken well, over I'm the saying, whole system. Yeah. And I think that's something. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that's something we have to anticipate in any measure to redistribute yeah, wealth yeah, because it is yeah. truly perceived as a violent a violent re re leveling of things yeah. from those people in power they have this insecurity yeah. at the top of the pyramid that they really perceive anything yeah. that will threaten them as violence that's really a, a really interesting phenomenon yeah. they genuinely believe that it is an existential threat to them to you know yeah. create a livable world for us now the, for i think us. one of the dangers we face is that human beings often don't make major changes until there is a catastrophe. And I'd say that uh, it, in Europe, World War II was a catastrophe. And it's sometimes been called the, you know, the collective suicide of Europe. I mean, their, their cities and, and uh, their populations were just devastated. But I think what they learned from that catastrophe was they had to have a different way of organizing their economies and politics. Now, they didn't go to, to the uh, I'd say ideal extremes that I would support, but they went further than we went, and I think in part because they experienced the war and and they saw how, how we had to make major major changes. The U.S. did not experience the war at home. I mean, it didn't hit the American mainland the way it hit Europe, and uh, I, I think that uh, what I'm hoping is that we won't have to have another catastrophe, uh, a third world war before we wake up to the fact that we have to make uh, major changes. Um, maybe maybe the, uh, the climate change, the global warming will become so, you know, unavoidably present that, that the, you know, people will stop denying it. <clears throat> maybe there will have to be, um, well, not that we have any choice. We're seeing what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, we're seeing, you know, violence the likes of which we haven't seen since World War II in, in Europe now. And uh, uh, yeah. if, we, if we don't learn from this before the disaster, we will only learn if we learn it at all ever, and even if we survive after the disaster. And I think we just need to to try to approach people, even people that as I said, we disagree with and who disagree with us in a spirit of respect <coughs> and mutual mutual danger. Because after all, if, if we have a third world war or global warming just becomes as catastrophic as, it's, as it will if we don't do something very quickly, uh, we're, we're going to be experiencing the catastrophe. And so I, I just hope we can say, look, we're we're not out to uh, we're not out to punish the rich. We're trying to save and protect the rich from something that's going to threaten them, just as it will also threaten uh, other people. Uh, and we're not out to insult or humiliate them. We're trying to enlist them with us to try to you know avoid humiliating anybody. Uh, the, yeah, that's a great yeah. distinction to make too. Indeed. Indeed, because we can't we can't pursue these avenues of solution and and you know end up with any level of efficacy uh, until we do truly unite. And what that means is we've got to include everyone, yeah. whether or not they're yeah. on our side, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the same demographic as ourselves, or on the same uh, you know uh, politics side or football team side or whatever. We've got to put every single divisive mechanism sure. aside. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to, to piggyback on that a little bit, we have to listen to what those people yeah. want. Also, we have to yeah. respect yeah. their needs and desires. We have to yeah. show them the respect, you know, that, that, that everybody wants. And, and if there's issues that they are concerned yeah. with, that they're afraid of, then we have to listen to that. We have to be inclusive yeah. of those, uh, you yeah. know, opinions, of, you know, just re regardless of, of who yeah. these people are, or where they are or what yeah. they're doing presently. You know, otherwise, otherwise the systems are bound or, or whatever solutions we're yeah. trying to implement are bound yeah. to backfire. No, I, I I totally agree with you, and I just I think we really need to um, do whatever we can to get warring sides together. Uh, one of my best friends is uh, uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, 
British and Northern Irish parliaments. Uh, uh, and he, he is, uh, his major achievement in life was to bring about an end to the war in Northern Ireland by getting the two sides to be able to sit in the same room with each other, talk to uh, what, what, John what is his Aldernice. name? He's now Lord Aldernice. He was elevated to the House of Lords because he basically was such a central figure in ending the uh, kind of the civil war in Northern Ireland. Uh, he's a psychiatrist like hmm. me. We're, we're old friends. And uh, I have great respect Beautiful. for him. Uh, but he showed how you can do something that had seemed impossible for you know decades. Uh, and I think we need to, hmm. to learn from people like that uh, how to do that in this country uh, and around the world. Uh, but it is a matter of you know, trying to get enemies who are ready to kill each other to be willing to sit in the same parliament, to shake hands, to talk with each other civilly. Uh, I mean, he mentioned what a, how difficult it was to get them to even recognize the existence of each other. Uh, so it's, you know, it takes great tact and skill and patience. And I think that's what we have to do. So in the spirit of sitting down with one of the uh, violent prisoners, that you worked with, you spoke about walking them through the minutes that led up to their crimes because they didn't realize, they really did not realize what the, what they did was wrong. So I think the difficulty that I see in bringing together uh, basically the rich and the dispossessed to the same table is that the wealthy do not realize whatsoever that what they have been doing is one, founded upon this greater legacy of violence and domination, and two, that what they're doing is wrong, and that they, they, have, they genuinely believe that what they're doing is, is feeding life, that it, it is bringing about you know, the sequences of life and feeding people and housing them and keeping the system going, when in reality it's doing quite the opposite. So I, I wonder if you could sort of hypothetically, like, how could you address somebody like that, somebody who has done great unconscious harm structurally, because I, I sense there is a deep unconscious understanding within people like this that they what they have done is violent and that there's a greater apprehension to address it. There's an insecurity. There's a fragility that when you poke it, that like those business people who were going to coup the United States because of modest wealth redistribution that the peoples of Europe take for granted, that any method, any measure of wealth redistribution is going to be perceived as great violence. So how could you rhetorically bridge that gap? I'd say we have to begin – by recognizing that not all rich people are the same, and that there are some people who are wealthy. Again, I, I mentioned Franklin Roosevelt was independently wealthy, but he, and you know, maybe because he had polio, who knows? I mean, he 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 realized he wasn't all powerful, and you know, some people might have responded with humiliation to that, but he responded with compassion, I think, for other people who had suffered, and uh, uh, there are others who have been who have used their wealth to try to increase uh, equality in, in, in the world. Uh, but I, what we have now is the highest degree of inequality we've had since the Great Depression, uh, or just before the Great Depression. I think we would, but I would start with the people who, even in the uh, among the wealthy, who are most open to hearing what we have to say, or who would be most sympathetic to what we're saying. And in, 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 in the sense that we are not setting out to be their enemies. We're, we're trying to work it cooperatively with them to save our whole our whole society and basically our whole species. Uh, this has got to be a worldwide thing at this point. Uh, and I would start with the people that we can reach and talk to. And they themselves may then be able to, you know, to build bridges uh, to other people that would not listen to us but might listen to them and so on. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't pretend to have, uh, you know, a magic solution to how to, how to reach people who, uh, 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 well, let me, let me take it back and say, I think there may be some people we're not going to reach, that we just, we, we, we don't need to waste our breath uh, on, on, on some people and realize that uh, uh, all we can do is show them that we're not out to punish them. Uh, we're, we're out to make everything fairer for everybody, but we're not. We we don't want them to be poor any more than we want anybody else to be poor. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and actually, uh, I think the the final sort of um, point here. I think you've been a very outspoken, uh, essentially a prison abolitionist, 
in, in changing the attitude of punishment and changing the attitude of what we do with violent individuals. Um, if yeah. we could sort of kind of bring things full circle and like the solutions to violence or the solutions to those people who are sick in that way, in a non-prison sort of yeah. uh, punishment-based modality. You know, you're right. And in fact, what I'd say is I'm not so much a prison abolitionist as a prison replacer. I would replace prisons with an entirely different kind of approach. I would replace punishment with education and psychotherapy and medical care and, and the opportunity to do meaningful work and get mm -hmm. meaningful compensation for it and so forth. Uh, Absolutely. To, be, to have people share uh, share the food, share the housing, share the, uh, the, the things that people need to live. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I'm imagining what a reality show of, of a bunch of billionaires who have to live in a, a like a really nice house and share everything and they're just they're yeah. just like eating each other's ben and jerry's and squabbling and like oh, that would be the one reality show i would bother watching yeah, i would yeah. actually pay for yeah. cable everything for is that. really nice for them and everyone's treating them really well and they're just throwing yeah. tantrums they're like i i need more than you and it's like no, no jeff it's okay it's gonna be okay you got everybody has enough it's fine you don't have to hoard your birthday yeah. cake that's the point of birthday cake is everybody eats it. Yeah. Let them have I cake. Say, I do think that nonviolent protest, nonviolent uh, uh, action uh, is it, really essential here. Uh, we, we know that that doesn't, I mean, no matter what we do, there's going to be a, uh, a backlash against it. I mean, every time we've made progress, for example, in dealing with racial inequalities in this country, there's been a backlash against it. The same with uh, equality of uh, women, uh, you know, with, with men uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, so I think we, uh, I don't mean to be utopian about this. I do. I sometimes, <laughs> I sometimes have said that my most, my most optimistic scenario for our future is that we may wind up with a catastrophe for the third world war or global warming out of control before people finally wake up. But I, I could only hope that we can get there before the catastrophe. Because if we don't, the catastrophe is gonna happen anyway. And uh, all I can do is try to uh, educate people about it as much as we can. Uh, you know, one thing that is important here is education. What I found in the Massachusetts prisons, the one program that was 100% successful in, in preventing violent recidivism and re-imprisonment was getting a college degree while in prison. Hmm. And we had several hundred people who had been able to do that because professors from Boston University donated their time to come in and teach college credit courses. It's Not lovely. one of these guys, what, over a 25 year period, was returned to prison for a new crime. And uh, I, I uh, when I announced that in a public lecture, our new Republican governor said, we've got to stop this program because otherwise people who are too poor to go to college will start committing crimes <laughs> or they can get sent to prison to get a free college education. That's the, that's the mentality, well, right? I mean, <laughs> maybe they could build a society uh, where people don't have to either go to war or go to prison to get an education, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I said, this is what I said. Or the richest society or one of the richest societies that's on ridiculous. earth although the riches are very unequally distributed. But we could afford to have a free education for everybody. We provide free primary school. We provide free high school. Exactly. We provide free college for everybody in the country. Yeah. And, and, well, and the I'll, thing I'll is, say a, a John D. Rockefeller's response to that. We need a nation of workers, not a nation of thinkers. <laughs> and it's essentially, well, you know, it's essentially gets back to that, that kind of punishment mentality and that if yeah. we have – a working class that is educated enough to realize how, how yeah. badly they are getting screwed and how unequal yeah. the arrangement is and that it doesn't have to be this way. I think if we have a, a nation of people that are critically minded and that are really aware of what's going on, they will not submit, plain and simple. If they truly understand and if people truly understood the depths of structural violence, that a child dies of hunger every one, two, three, four, five seconds, yeah. that yeah. millions yeah. of people, no, so, something like, I think you said something like, Oh, there's a fantastic quote that you said about basically uh, the, the deaths that are caused by poverty is like an accelerating thermonuclear bomb. Can, can you yeah, re sort yeah. of re reiterate that? Well, yeah. As I said, the, the, the deaths that are caused by poverty, meaning 
relative poverty, inequality, uh, are killing more people than all the wars in history. Uh, the, uh, well, Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize in Economist from India, has shown that when, when there were famines and people starved to death by the millions, it wasn't because there was not enough food around. It was because the poor didn't have enough money to buy the food with. I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane, you know, to permit things like this to happen in, in society. And I think that we can, we can uh, educate people about that. And, uh, I, you know, as I've said, if college education can, can help violent criminals to choose nonviolent ways of living, I'm hoping that we can give a kind of education to everybody, including uh, some of those who benefit or think they benefit from the present economic system, yeah. uh, to educate them about the dangers to them and their children mm -hmm. and grandchildren right, right. and so on. Uh, that, that's all. I, I believe in education. Is, isn't that amazing? You said 100% of those people didn't, uh, they didn't, re, there were no reoffenders essentially? Yeah. Wow. That that is truly. I, I mean, that, that just echoes the point we were making earlier about the whole, you know, yeah. re, having access to resources and equality. I mean, because yeah. when they when they get the college education, that essentially levels the playing field in a lot of ways. Exactly. Right. And in fact, there's no more direct way to gain, you know, self esteem and the opposite of shame, feelings of pride and self esteem and self worth, mm -hmm. than to gain knowledge and skills that you can respect in yourself, so so you have self respect, mm. and that elicits respect from other people. Absolutely. And and I, I, that's why I really would push for free college education and free graduate school education. Mm -hmm. People want it. I mean, well, we'll, we'll, uh, on, on this show, Jim, we're going to push it a step further. We want free college education. We want free housing. We want free health care. <laughs> we want free food and water. I, we totally want agree. free social services. We want free uh, airships for all people. We. We want, free, but, we want a free world that's uninhibited by yeah. all of these these degrading and and uh, all these shackles of an imprisoned existence. We want true freedom. We want free people. We want a world mm -hmm. where people are not unequal. Yeah. And that's, we want freedom I, from money. Yeah. Freedom from money. Yeah, Absolute yeah. money, right, Matt? Absolutely. And uh, this is kind of an abstract observation to make, but I think it's an important one to make as we progress toward the proverbial transition that we've spoken so long about trying to materialize, and that is the use of the word free. Of course, free means without paywall, without cost, without arbitrary expectation or compensation, I should say. But in a world where everybody has access to the things that Marlowe just, just riddled off, <clears throat> they wouldn't be free per se. They would just be available. They would be yeah. there to be utilized and enjoyed mm -hmm. versus right. free in the context right. that somebody else is losing out on compensation. Right. And, and, yeah. and it goes so much like to another concept that we're kind of promoting lately with uh, the difference between um, like a trade based system or transactional based system. We, we call this tra trade based reciprocity or transactional reciprocity to a, to a system that promotes systemic reciprocity, essentially, to where the yeah. system itself takes care of, you know, providing everybody with what they need. And everybody just puts into the system when and where they can on a voluntary basis uh, to, to keep the system going, essentially, you know, rather than there being yeah. a transaction with every single necessity right. or, you know, good or service that everybody needs to procure on a daily basis, just the system does everything itself. And we can develop these systems. You know, I mean, if there's one thing like David Graeber's yeah. new book, um, you know, it's just such such an amazing book. Uh, the the late David Graeber, unfortunately, but the but the last book that was released, The Dawn of Everything. He he goes and talks about, especially like come at some of the new research that has been, uh, uh, you know, discovered lately regarding regarding ancient civilizations, even even before you know uh, the Neolithic Revolution and all this. And, and essentially, right, right. what they're finding is there is just a vast array of arrangement of societies and and in, yeah. in uh, you know prehistoric times, and it's it's way more complicated and diverse than we ever yeah. really could have thought or given credit to these ancient peoples. And it really just goes to show more than anything that we can organize society however we want. 
You know, it, we, we have right. the capability right. to do that. And, and, and yeah. if we really yeah. consciously put forth the time and effort to create these systems and structures that provide everything for everybody with through through means of systemic reciprocity, then we can do that. We're smart enough. We're intelligent enough. We're adaptable enough to do these things. And if we consciously move in these directions with these goals and, uh, you know, and, and create these projects you know, with these intentions, we can do this as, as both a community, as a as a region, as a nation as a species even you know as a global community we we can solve these problems if we can come together and implement these solutions and create these new systems and structures and way of life so that's my two uh, cents. I, 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 I not only agree with that i'd say there have been societies that have done that right uh, certainly we, we don't have to we don't have to copy them in every detail but we can learn from them, the principles involved. Mm -hmm. The, the Hutterites, for example, are a you know, group you know, similar to Mennonites and Amish. They're strictly nonviolent. Mm. They live in communal settings where, as you said, it's not a question of money. Everybody shares the same food, the same housing, uh, the same education. Now, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't share their, their religious beliefs, but that's not the issue. You, you, can, you can learn from the way they live. But, you know, they, they've not had a single uh, case of murder, hmm. you know, in 150 years of living in this country. Wow. I mean, they're the most nonviolent people imaginable. And they are they are communists. But it's like primitive Christian communism is what they <laughs> would call it. Well, what I'm saying is you don't have to support any one particular religion or another to agree with it. You can learn from that, that this is a social uh, way of living together that really can be has been tried, it's been successful, it's shown that people are not inherently violent. Uh, I mean, violence is not instinctual. If it were, it would be universal. And it's not universal. Great uh, It's point. highly, highly mm. valuable. That's a Absolutely. lovely, uh, profound statement to yeah. make for those who would push the argument that competition is mm -hmm. innate on a violent level and that uh, violence yeah. is innate and, and necessary, even dominance, you know, on... on um, on an arbitrary level, you know, all those, all these things are things I'm met with when I say to someone that this is all unnecessary. This is, this yeah. is an unnatural yeah. level of violence and competition we're experiencing and participating in. It's operant conditioning. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. It's, we're we're conditioned right. to, to right. be violent in this society. That's exactly and right. And in the same way that the prison, imprisoning people is far more uh, expensive and resource intensive than educating them and giving them the access that they need to live. I think that the exactly. continuation of this violent system, this wasteful system, uh, is far more resource intensive, is, is costing us the wealth mm -hmm. of the world. It's costing us our actual capacity yeah. to regenerate life, to feed ourselves, to have a yeah. habitat at all. And so this, this yeah. idea of systemic reciprocity, this idea of sort of raising all boats universally, of meeting our needs, basically, of creating equality. I mean, that's something that is supposed to be embedded into the fabric of our society, of our people, of our nation. Yeah. And it's not something that we're fighting for. It's something that we're fighting against. Yeah. And with the same logic yeah. of the violence that, that is just so embedded in our world, we fight change. We fight it tooth and nail. And we do violence to it. We do great violence to our own future in our own minds first by telling ourselves this is not possible this is the way it must be yeah. and just as in the mm -hmm. way that punishment is an inversion of of uh of the violent impulse it just it increases it it doesn't do what we think it does and i think the ability for us to step out of this mental prison this real prison that we're in every single moment of every day that we can't see another way of life that is the way to true freedom to educate ourselves to find freedom yeah. to find mm -hmm. a liberation from this and to, yeah. to really enter into a, a, a state of peace. And this is a word that is laughed at in America, peace, that if anybody yeah. came out and they were crusading for peace, they would be laughed at. But if yeah. somebody came out and they were fighting for war, they said, we need more war, they'd get cheers. And that is a truly sick society, a society that we can fix, that we can well, condition ourselves out yeah. of this by creating a better environment. Yeah. And, and what you've just described is what I, I, I and many anthropologists would call a shame culture, mm -hmm. where people are shamed for being nonviolent and rewarded and given pride and honor for being violent. Mm -hmm. but that's what we have to outgrow. Absolutely, and we have to demonstrate that the opposite is possible, essentially. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and the more exactly. we demonstrate that, live that in our own lives, the more we can build these things and show people, I think the more people will catch on. It'll be like, you know what, this makes a yeah. lot more sense. Why, yeah. don't, we, why yeah. don't we start doing this too? Like, <laughs> that's right. You know? so. Well, Jim, I think we're running up on time here, but do you have any closing statements? Well, what I would say is that we are at an existential 
point of crisis in our evolutionary history of, of our species, uh, and that, that the problem of violence, if we can't learn to control and prevent it better than we have up to now, uh, really could lead beyond genocide to what I would call humanicide. Mm. We could literally render ourselves as a species extinct. Well, not we just us. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry. Oh, and the, the other... <laughs> the, Ecocide. No, I, 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 yeah. the, other, the other species. Uh, you know, I firmly agree on something Albert Schweitzer talked about years ago, which he called reverence for life. Mm. And I'd say it's, that is that attitude. And I don't think it has to be tied to any one particular religious background. I just think it's a psychological attitude and the capacity that we need to develop, and I think we all have the capacity for, if, if it's not inhibited, uh, to have reverence for life, that means for all species. Because for one thing that's clear, the human species can't live without the other species. Mm -hmm. I mean, we benefit from the diversity of species. We harm ourselves as well as those species. Absolutely. When we render species extinct, which we are doing at the highest rate that we've ever done in our mm -hmm. history as a species on this earth. So we, you know, it's not just a matter of human survival, it's really the survival of life on earth. And we human beings could, could destroy it. And we are at greater danger of doing that now than we've ever been. Humanity has been living on the edge of a thermonuclear volcano and a climate change volcano and we've been hoping that it would not erupt, mm. but there is no guarantee that it won't. Uh, let me put it this way. In the course of evolution, 99% of species that have ever existed have become extinct. Mm. You know, and neither God nor nature have granted human beings any exemption from those statistical odds. So mm. we, we have to fight against the, the statistics to, to keep ourselves alive, and we're not doing a good job of it at this point. Just look at Ukraine, look at World War II, look at genocide, look at thermonuclear war, mm -hmm. look what we're doing to the climate. And you have to say, we have never been in more danger. And the problem is violence. This is violence against human nature and violence against the natural world and, and the other species and so on. So uh, that's why I, I think this is the single most important uh, problem facing the human species at this point. And I just uh, hope we can alert people to that fact. Absolutely. Agree 100%. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Jim, you're doing the lion's work. I mean, you're, 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 doing, you're doing a great job in everything that you're saying, and you've been crusading that for, at this for so long. And I just hope that people start to listen. And I hope that shows like this well, will help to spread that. It's been a great honor talking it. to you. I'm sure we'll have you on again sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I really, I always learn so much and it, my heart grows. And I think that's, that's really the best that we can hope for, to revere life greater through each other. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm really honored to have been invited to uh, participate in this. I so appreciate what you're doing. I think that you, what you're doing is precisely the closest I can come to an answer to the question we've been talking about. <laughs> how can you how can you educate people? Mm. But that's what, what you're doing. Thank you so well, much. Thank you for helping for us with that. Time. Yes, Absolutely. I'm so excited for our listeners to hear. Yeah, thank you. it's been a great conversation. Really, really enlightening. Thank you for taking the time. And, thank and you so much. I absolute pleasure. What, what 100%. You're doing. responsible for all, meaning all human beings are responsible for each other, meaning we are all responsible for each other. Uh, I've often said to my patients, we all need all the help we can get, and the fact is that's true. We need to help each other. When you, uh, when you understand that, there is no shame in needing help because everybody needs help from all kinds of people throughout their lives. We all depend on that. And uh, there's no such thing as being totally independent. Uh, that's just an illusion, uh, which many people are willing to uh, engage in a great deal of violence in order to uh, uh, satisfy that illusion. But uh, the fact is we, we all need each other. We're all in this together. We're all responsible for each other.